Okay, so I'm going to be reading the book True, Sort of, by Katherine Hannigan. So here is chapter one. Delia Pattinson was tiny. Her hair curled tight to her head like a copper halo. Her voice was raspy, as if a load of gravel lined her throat. And Deli Pattison was trouble. Little trouble on the way to big trouble. And getting closer to it every day. Deli's trouble wasn't mean. It always started with her thinking something would be fun and good. It always ended with somebody yelling, Delaware Pattison, to your room! Or, welcome to detention, Miss Pattison, again. And there'd Deli be, wondering how something that had seemed so right could go so wrong. Truth is, Trouble didn't find Deli till she was six years old. That was the summer the Pattinsons went to the county fair. Clarice Pattinson went, said to Boomer, Let's take the kids. They can look at the cows and go on a couple of rides. Sounds good, Boomer agreed. So they piled all those children, Dallas, the oldest, then Tallahassee, Montana, Galveston, Delaware, and RB, the baby, into the van and headed out. There were eight Pattinsons in the parking lot. Boomer checked again when they entered the poultry pavilion. It wasn't until they got the cat got to the cattle corral that Clarice realized somebody had gone missing. She counted heads, then shouted, Deli! There was no reply. The Pattinsons scattered, searching under tractors and behind hay bales for her. By then, though, Deli had ten minutes of solitude in the poultry pavilion. Clayton Fitch saw it first, chickens of every sort strutting out the front door of the building like they were going on vacation. The chickens are loose, he squeaked. Then he ran in circles, squealing, Great God Almighty, the chickens are loose! Officer Verena Tibbetts was at the main gate, making sure nobody got in for free. She came tearing over, hollering, Clayton, quick squawking and catch those chickens! She charged in the pavilion, searching for the cause of the chaos. Halfway down the line of cages, she found it. There was Deli Pattison, standing on a crate. She had her hand in the coop, pushing a chicken's backside. Go on now, you're free, she rasped as it, flapped, as it flapped to the floor. Officer Tibbetts ran at her. She picked Deli up and held her so close they could smell each other. It is bad to let those chickens out of their cages. Bad, 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 she roared. Then she braced herself for the bawling that was sure to follow. But this is what Deli did instead. She smiled. The ends of her mouth went up, almost to her eyeballs. They're funny, she giggled. At first, Verena was so surprised, she just stared. And then she growled. And that's how Clarice found them, one growling and the other grinning. Take this child home, Officer Tibbetts told her. So she did. It took ten people two hours to get those chickens back in their cages. When they were done... Deli was number one on Verena Tibbetts' list of worst children in River Bluffs. Chapter 2 The trouble went on from there. When she was seven, Deli grabbed a pan of brownies off of Mabel Silcox's back porch. Where did these come from? Clarice asked when she found them half eaten in Deli's room. Miss Silcox left me a sir present, Deli told her. Her smile was so big it squeezed her eyes shut. What's a sir present? Clarice inquired. It's a present that's a surprise. It's the best kind, Deli explained. Mabel Silcox had another word for it. I've been robbed, she hollered. Clarice brought Deli in for questioning. You still want to call those brownies a present? A sir present, ma, she corrected her. To your room, Clarice commanded. But, she argued. Go, Clarice replied. So she did. Sometimes Ma is a mysteriosity, she told the empty pan of brownies. When she was eight, Deli decided it was too fine a day outside to spend it inside and at school. A Deli holiday, she declared it. Before she took off, though, she wrote a note that read, Please excuse Deli. She'll be back tomorrow. She signed it and sent it into school with the Debt Barn twins. She didn't want anybody worrying. So she did not fret, swinging and sliding at the park when Officer Tibbetts pulled up in her cruiser. She was not worried when the policewoman ordered, Deli, get in the car, from the back seat. She waved at the people they passed like she was, on, like she was in a holla deli parade. She was confused, though, when Clarice and Boomer told her, You're grounded. For a week. This is a mis mistaster, she told them. They did not disagree. 
When she was nine, Delia found a canoe Clayton Fitch kept by the river and took it for a ride. She wanted to see where she'd end up. We're going on a Delhi venture, she told the boat, and it rocked and rolled down the river for her. They came aground in Hickory Corners, two towns and ten miles away. The police called Clarice. In the van going home, Clarice's lips were sealed tight with worry and fury. So Delhi filled the silence. Ma, I saw turtles as big as boulders, she said. That boat banged into rocks and went backwards, but I wasn't scared, she went on. Ma, next time I'm going all the way to... Clarice pulled the van off the road. Deli, she yelled. Nobody knew where you were. You could have been killed. Her whole body was shaking. But Ma, she explained, like Clarice was a little kid. I was wearing a life jacket. Enough, Clarice shouted, and they were moving again. Back home, Deli did find out where she'd end up if she took a canoe down the river. In your room for two weeks, Clarice told her. She had to pay Clayton Fitch a rental fee, too. Bad, badder, baddest, he said as she set the money in his hand. When she was ten, Deli invented the no cuss dictionary. She made up words people could say instead of swearing, like shikes, chisel, and ball grammet. She wrote them down, then she shared them with all the kids she knew. Not cussing, she told them. Can't be trouble. There was something about the way the children said those words, though, so loud and with such delight that made the grown-ups suspicious. They asked questions, and the no cuss dictionary and deli were the answer to them. For three dinners, Deli had soap for dessert. Bubbles floated out of her mouth as she complained. But Ma, we weren't swearing. That's not the point, Clarice answered. What is? She gurgled. Clarice just shook her head. There was more. Big trouble, small trouble, Christmas, and birthday trouble, too. Still, eating soap or stuck in her room, Deli never quit believing that fun was just two steps and a ball grammet away and she didn't stop smiling. Chapter three. Maybe it was because she was tiny, or because her hair curled too tightly to her head, or because it was from being be being called bad so many times. Whatever it was, when Deli was 11, she took a turn, and it wasn't for the better. At first, it was small things. She quit doing homework and started talking over people. None of that was new, exactly. Deli would always forget homework for some fun, or she wasn't much for manners. But now, when her teacher, Lionel Terwig Terwilliger, told her, Miss Pattison, please wait. Someone else is speaking. She didn't smile and say, sorry, like before. She slumped down in her seat when he said, Your homework is late. You may bring it in tomorrow with a penalty. Instead of saying, Okay, thanks, she mumbled, Just give me the zero. I'm worried about Deli, Clarice told Boomer. He nodded. The bad grades? That's not it, she said. The detentions? No. All those trips with Officer Tibbetts? It's her smile. Clarice's voice is cracked. It's gone. The smile that filled Deli's face had disappeared. In its place was a smirk. The smirk pinched her mouth crooked and just pretended happiness. It hurt Clarice's heart every time she saw it. She'll get it back, Boomer assured her. Clarice nodded, hoping that was true. Deli did get something, but it wasn't her smile. She got the fight instead. It happened on a Wednesday at recess. Alice May Gunderman kicked a ball up on a school roof, and Alice May cried. Deli saw the whole thing. She knew what to do for Alice May, and for fun. She shimmied up the downspout and onto the roof, Hey, Alice May, she hollered and kicked the ball back to her. Deli knew she'd done good. The corners of her mouth started to curl. Then Miss Naderbaum, the recess monitor, spotted her. Deli Pattinson, get off that roof, she shouted. So she did. There was a big map of the United States on the basketball court. Alaska was way off by itself. It was for timeouts. To Alaska, Miss Niederbaum commanded. Deli looked at Alice May, smiling and playing again. But, she muttered, Go, Miss Niederbaum ordered. And Deli didn't ask why, because she knew the answer was. 
She was bad, she was wrong, she was trouble. She nudged to the state of solitary confinement, hearing those words, bad, wrong, trouble, over and over, as if they were her name. Danny Novello saw the whole thing, too. He was grinning. He ran up beside Deli, bringing a crowd of kids with him. She's small enough, he told them, and she climbs like one. Let's see if she can talk. Can you speak? He asked the side of her face. The crowd giggled. Do you talk? He shouted in her ear. Now, any other day, Deli would have hit him with a, hey, no braino, talk to me when you get one, and that would have shut him up. But the only words she could think of were bad, wrong, trouble, and they were about her. Grrr, she growled. Can't talk? Must be a monkey, Novello yelled, and laughs, buzz, laughs buzzed around Deli, stinging her. She, she slumped down on Alaska. Bad, wrong, trouble. Pounded her with every heartbeat. She could feel the tears pooling up behind her eyeballs. But Deli Pattinson didn't cry. She said, so she said something mad to stop the sad. I'm sick of feeling bad, she grumbled. Right away, her tears, her eyes quit watering. I'm sick of getting in trouble and not knowing why, she slapped the state beneath her. Her heart stopped hurting. The mad was taking over. The feeling bad wasn't done with her, though. So what are you going to do about it? It sneered. The mad didn't know. Till Novello walked by, teasing. Hey, monkey, time to go back to the zoo. It took nine seconds to catch... It took Deli nine seconds to catch Novello and fling him to the ground. There were six seconds of twisting his nose till he screamed. I take it back! I take it back! It took Miss Niterbaum just two seconds to yank Deli off of him. It took 9,000 seconds of sitting on Alaska for that. But for those 15 seconds of fight, Deli wasn't sad and she didn't feel bad. And for once, she understood why she was in trouble. It was worth it. After that, if somebody snickered behind her, Deli shoved him. If a kid whispered anywhere near her, Deli took her down. She got into so many fights with so many kids, only R.B. and the Detbart twins would come close. Every other friend deserted her. One day, after two calls from school and a special Deli livery from Officer Tibbetts, Clarice had had enough. What is going on with you, Deli? She yelled. What is wrong? So Deli told her, no smirk or smart stuff. I'm horribatable, Ma. What's horribatable? Clarice asked. Horrible, terrible, bad, Deli told her, like everybody says. That's not true, Clarice replied. You're not bad. But Clarice hadn't changed Deli's mind about her badness. Not one bit. Chapter 4. Deli Panson was born smiling. That's one happy baby, Mabel Silcox said. That baby's too happy, Clayton Fitch scowled. Even after the trouble took over, Deli started every day with a smile. As soon as her eyes opened, she'd cheer, Jiminy Fipes, and run down a break fat, run down a breakfast grinning. But now, the feeling bad went to bed with her. Another day of trouble, it would tell her when she woke up. She'd wait till Clarice hollered, Last call, Deli, to bring herself out of bed. It had been a long time since her smile made it downstairs. The Saturday the Boyds came to town, though, was different. That morning, the top of Deli's head twitched, like every hair was hopping with excitement. Then her whole body tingled. It was the feeling that told her that a surpresent was coming. Happy hallelujah, she shouted, and bounced out of bed. The surpresent feeling didn't show up too often, maybe once or twice a year. But every time it did, something wonderful came Deli's way. Like the hockey skates she got out of out of the teeter's garbage or the five dollars she found on the IGA floor. All Deli had to do was show up at the right place at the right time and a surpresent would be waiting for her. That morning the surpresent feeling filled her so there was no room for feeling bad. Her lips couldn't help curling at the corners. She ran to the top of the stairs. Ma! she called. Clarice came to the bottom of the steps with a spatula in her hand. Are you baking a cake? Deli asked. No, Clarice told her. 
Did you get us a puppy? No. Are we going on a trip? Deli. Clarice was waving the spatula like a weapon. You get down here or you'll be on a trip to, uh, or you'll be on a trip to I miss my breakfast land. Okay, Ma, she grinned, not minding Clarice's tone or temper, because after all the trouble, something good was finally coming to her. When she got downstairs, the smile was still there. Clarice Pattinson worked at the hardware store in town. Boomer Pattinson drove trucks long distance, so he was gone more than he was home. That left Clarice alone with six children, one of them Deli. She was a hard-working woman, tired most of the time. Four of the Pattinson children were peaceful, but Galveston and Deli were like volatile chemicals. Put near each other, those girls would explode. Meal times were worse for it. Food had been thrown, children had been flown. So Clarice assigned seats. She set Galveston beside her and put Deli between Dallas and Tallahassee. If a fight broke out, Clarice would grab Gal and those two would squeeze Deli till she calmed down. That morning, though, Gavison got after Deli the second she stepped in at breakfast. We're almost done fixing breakfast, she hissed. You're supposed to make toast. Get going. Now, on any other day, Deli would have grabbed the spatula and snarled, Gal, I'm going to flip you like a giant pancake. Next thing, the fur would have been flying. But Deli had, Deli had so much surpresent feeling in her, there was no room for the fight. She walked to the toaster, humming. What's wrong with her? Gavison jeered. Nobody answered, because nobody knew. At the table, Deli smiled at her orange juice, then hummed through her pancakes. Clarice ate with one hand on Gallison, holding tight to the piece. When she was done eating, Deli said sweetly, Hey, anybody hear about something special happening today? The others were stunned by the sweetness. What sort of something special? Clarice asked. Like free candy at the IGA, or Carlson's dog having puppies? I haven't heard anything, Clarice told her. Why? Deli's eyes got big and she whispered, as if it, saying it might scare it away. It's a surpresent, Ma. A surpresent's coming, and I can't miss it. Galveston snickered. Here we go. And Clarice's jaw squeezed her silent. Clarice's claw squeezed her silent. Now Clarice Pattinson liked surpresents about as much as he... L now... Clarice Pattinson likes her presence about as much as she likes seeing Officer Tibbetts at her door. More often than not, they meant trouble. But Deli had smiled. She was looking at Clarice, with her eyes full of needing something good. You'll find it, she told her. Deli grinned so that all her teeth showed. As soon as she set her plate in the sink, she ran to the door, calling, I'm going! Delaware Pattinson, Clarice yelled, and the smile Clarice had waited months to see was wiped away. What? Deli muttered, ready to hear what she'd done wrong. So instead of saying, I don't want the police near this neighborhood, Clarice told her, take a coat. That quick, the smile is back. It's going to be Jimungus, Ma, she said, grabbing her jacket. At the door, she whispered to the world, Here I come, Sir President. Smack me down with yourself. Chapter 5 R.B. Panson was seven years old and he loved Deli like Christmas. Deli ventures were his favorite. He liked it best if she invited him, but he'd tag along if she forgot. Deli was running, her feet whap, whapping on concrete. She was concentrating so hard on her surpresent, she didn't hear the whap whapping of somebody else's feet behind her. Till she got to the end of the street, she turned to see who the whapper was. And R.B. ran right into her. What the glub are you doing? She demanded. Going with you, he grinned. No, R.B., she told him. Now you now go home. R.B. stood still, like a possum pretending. Deli turned and started walking again. Whap, whap. Two seconds later, there was that other whapping. Deli faced him. R.B., she hollered. I'm trying to find my sir present. I know, he answered. That means no, no lug draggerers tagging along. What's a lug draggerer, he asked. If somebody who it's somebody who slows you down and has to tie a shoe fifty times a day. I'm not a lug dragger, he told her. And he was so sure of it, she couldn't tell him otherwise. Please, Del, he said sweetly. Ball gram it, she grumbled, because she couldn't say no to that. You got to do what I tell you, she ordered. I know. No whining. I know. No messing around. I know, I know, I know. 
And what about food for you? I'm not going home till I find my sir present. I have food in here for both of us. He showed her his backpack. It was loaded. Deli just hoped it wasn't cans of sardines and, sardines and broken up crackers like last time. You're something, she told him. But he, heard, but he heard it in her voice. He was something good. She took off again, with him beside her. At Main Street, R.B. grabbed her hand. Just for crossing, she said. I know. She didn't shake him off, though, well, when they got to the other side. five of True, sort of. Right there. And I'll be reading the rest of the book in the next couple weeks or so. So, yeah, that was the first video.